My name's Paul, Paul Boiting, um, Chair of the Winston Churchill Archive Trust. We're very privileged, I think, with the Winston Churchill Archive Trust to have the digital treasure trove that it represents. Um, we are able, because of digitalization, to get into uh, the archive. And it's so important in these challenging times of the pandemic when we are obliged to live in the world of the virtual. Uh, we're able with the Sir Winston Churchill Archive Trust to present to a wider world an insight into Sir Winston's life and times through his papers that wouldn't be possible if it was just there uh, in a physical, physical space. So I think the digitalization of the archive is a very precious thing. Now, what I'm concerned to do as a chair of the trust, and I think it's something that excites me and my fellow trustees, is to see how uh, we can make uh, this treasure trove all that much more accessible through digitalization, but also through its presentation in a way that appeals across the generations. One of the challenges of the times in which we, we live is to get a new generation uh, to be as excited and is to be interested in a time which for them seems a dim distant past, uh, albeit for us uh, in the older generation, a time which uh, we see as, as central. I didn't live uh, in uh, the 30s or 40s, uh, but I'm very much a child of that era. I mean, I, I was born in Britain, brought up in, uh, in, in West Africa, my earliest memories of childhood are of orange juice in medicine bottles. Now that means nothing <laughs> to uh, uh, the uh, modern child or even to the young person, but for anyone who is over the age of what, uh, 60, uh, maybe even 55, it, it's redolent of being a child of the National Health Service which came directly out of the beverage report that was commissioned uh, during uh, the time uh, when uh, Churchill uh, was uh, uh, very much center stage in British uh, politics and delivered indeed during a time when he was, uh, when he was prime minister uh, because there was a desire to make uh, children uh, grow up uh, uh, without the deprivations of vitamin C uh, that had characterized and caused rickets along with other vitamin deprivations in previous generations. Now, that means it doesn't mean anything uh, to a, a child today. It doesn't mean anything to a young person today who sees the World, the World, World War II as being something that, well, occasionally there may be programs uh, on the telly, there may, be, there may be a big film, although even those are less and less uh, these days. Uh, there's just no, no sense of how that time uh, to go back even before that, uh, to uh, the time in which uh, the British Empire was at its height. There's just no, no sense of that, really, although we all live with its legacy. So we need to find a way of opening up history and the nuts and bolts, the fabric of history, which an archive represents, uh, to, uh, to new generations. And I think digitalization and the presentation of work so it can get, and the preparation of teachers, so it can get into primary, secondary schools, so it can get into popular culture. Uh, th that's a real challenge, I think, uh, for anyone entrusted with the care of an archive. And one which we're very much up for uh, with our partners. That includes uh, Bloomsbury, but I'd like it also uh, uh, to include uh, other partners in education, uh, in, in philanthropy, who see the value of archival material. The future of Churchill scholarship, it seems to me, is getting to grips with the complexity of the man, uh, the challenges of his time, but also what we can learn as to how we approach 
contemporary issues. So let me give you a, an, an example. I'm fascinated uh, by the relationship between Churchill uh, and the Islamic uh, world. Uh, and Churchill in the context of events in the Sudan, uh, in uh, Palestine, uh, in Arabia, in Egypt. And I've also, as a cabinet minister and as a diplomat, lived and practiced what it is that politicians and diplomats do in a time when the Middle East and the Arab world and Islam have been center stage. So I'm interested in what we can learn about how we deal with contemporary challenges by understanding better their origins, but also by understanding how people, far-sighted people at the time approached the issue and the challenges that that era, part of the world presented. And I think Churchill's life is a very interesting example in that regard. The way, for instance, he constantly looked at history, met with uh, and, and sought to understand the history of the peoples of that region, met with peoples and spent time with peoples who had lived amongst the people of that region and listened to them in a way, frankly, uh, which we as contemporary politicians haven't done. I mean, I can't help but reflect on uh, the mess, frankly, that uh, we made, my generation, of uh, the uh, Iraq war's aftermath. Uh, if only, and it's all very well to say that now with the benefit of hindsight, but if only we'd spent some more time studying uh, the history of that region. If only we had perhaps listened more and there had been people available to us who had lived and really understood its complexity. Would we, had we spent the amount of time, for instance, that Sir Winston Churchill did uh, with the likes of Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, with Gertrude Bell, with people who really knew and understood and loved uh, those peoples in that region, would we would we have made the mistakes that, that we did? Because we didn't spend time actually doing that, you know. Uh, uh, you know, yes, it doesn't mean we didn't read intelligence reports and all the rest, but it, it's not the same. Uh, and I think one of the big lessons is that we've got to. We've got to put more resource, more time and effort into understanding his, the history of different, of different peoples. Uh, we need to rediscover the importance of language in the foreign service. You know, unfortunately, we're changing that now, I'm happy to say. They're putting more investment in, uh, in the study of languages. They're rediscovering the importance of the research department. Uh, in the foreign in the foreign office, but for many years we disinvested in that area, and I think that was uh, a mistake. And so archives and history, uh, and getting under the skin uh, of problem areas and historically rooted issues. Uh, that's so important in policy making. And I think archives and the study of people in different times has a role to play in that. The role of the archive in the midst of the current debates about Sir Winston Churchill and his legacy is to act as a depository of evidence, uh, is to provide an objective basis for a serious uh, an analysis uh, and to present the materials. Uh, it is for others to utilize those materials in scholarship and, and in study, but it is our job to protect and to preserve those materials. 
It's our job to treat them with uh, respect and its subject matter with, uh, with respect uh, and to make those materials uh, available, widely available. So it's not just a select few of protagonists on one side or the other in any debate who have access to the material evidence. It's a much wider grouping of people. You see, history is always, it seems to me, going to be the subject of contestation. It is contested ground, always has been, always will be. So Winston Churchill in his uh, life and in his work never ran away from controversy, was prepared to take unpopular uh, stands, was prepared to speak out and to say things which others either didn't want to hear and certainly weren't prepared to, weren't prepared to say. I think one has to create space for that in public discourse generally, but I think it has to be done always on the basis of civility and respect. <laughs> I think the R word is hugely important. Uh, respect is important. Respect for differing views, differing opinions, differing, differing peoples. And I think civility in discourse is something which we lose from public life at our peril. And I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite unashamed uh, in, uh, in, in, in holding out uh, and attesting to the importance of civility and respect in public discourse. We can't afford uh, to lose that ever. If I was speaking to a school child today who asked me why they should be interested in the church archive, I'd say, because it's fun. It's like getting into a time machine and going back in time and discovering stuff about a person and about the world in which that person lived. And it's about finding out too about somebody who actually was in many ways just like you, who faced the challenges that you face at school. Uh, and who overcame them, who got, you know, sometimes really fed up with his lessons, uh, but at the same time came to recognize the importance of study. Uh, it's about someone who was a person of action, but who always realized the importance of preparation and who realized the importance of uh, making yourself fit uh, to do any task, uh, whatever it was, whether it was leading a charge uh, <laughs> on horseback uh, or uh, leading a nation or building a wall or painting a picture, preparing the ground is important. You'll learn that through the archives. They're fun and they belong to you. They belong to the nation and you're part of the nation and part of that community uh, globally uh, that Sir Winston Churchill always found in his life exciting and stimulating and challenging. In summing up the future of the archive, the words that spring to mind are access, uh, global access, cross-generational, intergenerational conversation and access. So it's, it's about making the archive that much more accessible to that m greater number of people, but doing so in a way that brings together peoples from different parts of the world that were certainly important in uh, Winston Churchill's life. So, you know, looking at Africa, looking at the Middle East, as well as the Americas and Europe, looking, looking at that, and then looking at it in a way that says, well, how is that relevant to conversations between the different peoples in those lands, but also between the generations in those lands? Uh, younger people, uh, talking to each other about the content 
and about the times, but also older people talking to younger people. So it's access, global reach, and intergenerational conversation. <laughs>